All right. I do believe we're live. It is Tuesday night, and I am Dr. Boz watching uh, all of the week unfold in a hurry. This is Tuesday, and on our live show tonight, we have a big reveal. <laughs> we have my hemoglobin A1C along with a couple of my teammates that have been brave enough to say yes to coming on the show. So thank you, thank you, thank you for them for being brave. Be nice to them. <laughs> and I am uh, really excited not only to do a little more teaching, a little more deep dive into the Dr. Boz ratio, but uh, or excuse me, into your hemoglobin A1C, but also to answer some of your questions and um, maybe move the mic a bit closer. I love it when you guys help me on this thing. Um, let's see, it's, it's pretty close. Uh, hopefully that sounds pretty good to you guys. Uh, the teammates that are coming on are two of my favorites. I mean, the whole team's my favorite, but they're brave enough to come on the show and say their hemoglobin A1Cs and show all of you along. They don't know what mine is yet either, so <laughs> I love hearing where you guys are from. Before we get into the, the meat of this uh, lecture, I am, or this, uh, this bit of education, if you would, I am going to um, uh, do some of the traditions here on the show. Uh, first of all, we're going to check some numbers. So in the spirit of recovering from last week, which was me telling you that sometimes it's hard to get back on the wagon. Uh, the wagon for me is fasting every week, and I had been in Honduras, and then I had been in, um, it was the 4th of July, and then it was a week in uh, Houston, or not even Houston, where was I? Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, and then drove down to Austin. So a lot of traveling, and dang, I really did not feel like fasting at all, and I, I made it like 30 hours, and then I said, okay whatever. <laughs> I think my husband made me food and I said yes. So we're going to check some numbers here. This is a ketone countdown starting there at 10 seconds and we are about to do a glucose countdown. So I am about 48 hours into the fast and um, I, I think the numbers are going to be pretty good. Let's see. Ketones at one, glucose at 92. So not, not as good as they've been in the past weeks, but we are, um, I, I, I don't doubt it. Um, it is definitely uh, a lot easier to uh, get back on the wagon when my rhythm is good. I told my husband for, that for the first time in all of that travel, I finally slept through the night um, without waking up on, um, it was on, on this past Sunday. So that's not normal for me. I usually sleep great, but it was a lot of stress and several nights of just not sleeping well. And I saw my blood sugars go up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, that was me. So I, I don't doubt that that um, 92 is, um, is real. And then there might've been a little scramble right before the show, making sure that the sound works for the part that's coming up. Uh, something I, I continue to try hard to <laughs> make sure it does work, but I, I, I also can't guarantee um, <laughs> how technology works on this channel. But I do try. So I really enjoy seeing where everybody is from. I have a few announcements that um, I'm just going to talk through. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody that did this last Brains course. Um, I finished up our, our support groups today with the fourth and final class. And I just really praise those uh, folks that have uh, invested in the Brains course, not only for their own brain health, but also because they are the champions of trying to teach other people about how to improve brains. And it's really the forte of what my clinic was built around. And adding keto made it a huge, um, a much faster process and a much higher return for the people that were in uh that are under my care. Uh, but teaching most of what I do doesn't require a doctor. It is learning this and then how do we teach the next uh, next layer of Americans to not have to have these brains that aren't working so good by our 40s and 50s because of all of the chronic things that we're doing to them. So thank you, thank you for those that were there. We had um, some great new students that I got to know and I think they're gonna, I really look forward to what they do with the course. Um, Next, uh, I have one more. I've been counting down on um, 
this countdown, which is the Keto Orlando Summit. Uh, as much as I am super <laughs> thankful that Austin and KetoCon went so well, our table uh, served almost 300 uh, hemoglobin A1C tests uh, done right there in the moment. Uh, you, All of you that did them should be getting them back in the last day or so. At least all of our team did. So we're about to do our reveal uh, about what our hemoglobin A1Cs are and do some teaching around that. I also uh, just, it was an amazing stage of people that I got to meet. Uh, I did a follow-up podcast today with um, Dr. Mindy. Very interesting how much we say the exact same thing. I don't get a lot of time to study other people's channels, but when I send them to Dr. Mindy's, uh, boy, they get they get the same content, so it's not confusing. Um, it's also two women in about the same age range uh, really trying to improve our own health while we improve the patients that we guide. So, uh, boy, it's a very uh, powerful uh, connection we had on that podcast today. I don't think it airs for a couple of weeks, but stay tuned. We'll be doing some follow-up uh, stuff on YouTube together. Um, and then there were several other things over the uh, over that KetoCon that also got me excited. And one of them was that or the Keto Orlando Summit, which is in my state now that I live in Florida. I, I have um, not as many of my teammates coming. So I have, I think the booth is going to be run by the four, four boys, two interns. And uh, actually, I don't know that my youngest son is going to get to come. Uh, he has, uh, his school starts that, uh, that week. So I don't, he has a, a I think a band camp or something. Uh, and I have one other volunteer. So I, I look forward to a different generation of folks helping me in Orlando. And um, again, really putting my my efforts and my um, energy into growing uh, the community here in, in Florida. I just looking at some of the other texts out there. Somebody says, greetings from South Dakota. Hello. South Dakota still, uh, yeah, five generations there. I can't I can't not love that. So we have a really great show for you tonight. Before I hop in, I am going to say that I am I'm drinking some ketones. Uh, my sister is in town this week, and that's always a really big um, event for me because I get to relax and, you know, talk to one of the one of my favorites. Uh, so we are looking forward to going out tonight. But before I go out, uh, especially after you hear, hear this lecture, you're, I'm pre-treating with some ketones because I might have a glass of wine with my sister. But having ketones in the in my circulation, I mean, I already have them there, but I like to show people that I drink ketones when I want to boost my ketones, but I also show you that the products that are worth swallowing and paying money for, you should be able to measure the increase in ketones. So I do this live. <laughs> I, I check my ketones live to show you that the products that I put my name on, that I triple check in my uh, workflow and processes are definitely um part of uh, uh of uh not just the quality that i want for my patients but also what i want for me and my family uh all right so let's see there's one more thing i wanted to talk about before i get into the um get into the show so um oh i know what it was so this morning i had my support group in um in here, I have my support group every morning at the bowling alley in the parking lot next to my clinic. So if you're in the Tampa area and you're looking for a support group for keto, it's free. It's what I do for the community of keto uh, on a consistent basis because I want to A, teach about keto, but also you don't need to see a doctor um, to do the ketogenic diet. You do need a support group. And I'm a huge proponent that as I um, as my brand gets bigger than I was ever expecting it to, we are really working hard to create an environment of uh, supportive uh, resources, as many of them free as possible to, to make them as sustainable to the most people as possible. So I appreciate everybody tuning in. That really helps uh, the numbers of the channel. Uh, you know, looking at the metrics for YouTube, uh, this is definitely the medium to teach on. And I'm gonna do some of that tonight. So stick around, you're gonna find out my hemoglobin A1C. But you're also gonna see why we care so much. Uh, let me do one more, um, one more announcement here. So let's see, I think it's on, gotta go to the right button here. Oh, yes. Okay, so um, let me do this. Uh, I have one little thing to show you that on our store, 
Um, I do uh, have the hemoglobin A1C available for you. So if you haven't measured yours yet, uh, you can go to our store and look at your hem own hemoglobin A1C uh, by clicking on, let's see if I can go to it right here in front of me. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, here it is, hemoglobin A1C with the test. So if you haven't done that, you're going to want to do it before the end of this show. Uh, I will uh, be sh sharing two of my teammates uh, and helping you understand what we're going to do next with our results. So if you have tested your hemoglobin A1C in the last three months, it would be great to give a thumbs up just in the chat so I can see how much of my, the folks in the audience have checked their A1C. Um, again, your doctor should do this. This shouldn't be a hard ask, but uh, if you don't have diabetes and you're looking for um, uh, the results, we are super excited to partner with Omega Quant, who has really brought um, um, brought this test to your your doorstep. You can leave me out of it. I don't want to micromanage your A1C. I want to help you understand it. We're going to do some of that tonight. Uh, the other place that I do a ton of teaching, if you're looking for what I teach my patients as they come into my clinic, I use the book Keto Continuum. Uh, so having the... Um, Having the the workbook is what I really, oh, look at all the numbers coming in. Great to see all those A1Cs. Um, the workbook is, a, is the same handouts that I was using in my clinic that I've now put in a book. Uh, and I tell a story about Keto Continuum. And I just was really happy to see that Nana uh, wrote this great review that she titled Surprise. And thank you for the five stars. That means so much to anybody who's written a book. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that um, uh, improves the, the algorithm inside of Amazon books, but reviews. So I was pleasantly surprised when I opened this book and saw the font was large. Just so you know, I know my audience. <laughs> Yay, no squinting. Uh, this book, Keto Continuum, Consistently Keto Diet for Life, is a good read, moves right along. So interesting, eye-opening, and will get you more knowledge of the importance of ketones. Being and staying healthy uh, is living your best life. Thank you, Dr. Boz. So I appreciate that. That uh, review has uh, is powerful. So thank you, thank you. If any of the other folks out there have any any inkling to say thank you for the education or thank you for uh, the community, please, please leave a book review. So look at all those A1Cs of people coming in and there's some pretty good numbers there. So we are going to step over to a lesson and keep in mind that I have folks uh, helping me sort through uh, the questions that we're gonna answer tonight. We're gonna try to keep them per pertinent to hemoglobin A1C. So if you have questions that are relative to that, uh, it sure makes it easier for us to keep the podcast or keep the, the show about one similar topic. Okay. So we're going to start um, over here with, hold on, this is the one I want, and I want to turn uh, this on, there we go, perfect, okay, and we're going to turn, um, hold on, I want to go to Safari and turn that off. Okay, so this is... Um, the test that is hemoglobin A1C. And we are going to do a little test. So this is what we did at, at KetoCon. We gave away um, up to 600, but it took us a little longer time. And we actually, we, we took care of everybody that came to the table. It just was, uh, we, so we only did, I think, 300 of them. But I thought that was still pretty powerful for four days. Uh, Ask the gals who are doing this uh, with me at the table. We all, were, by the end, were tired of the exact same things we kept telling everybody about hemoglobin A1C. So as we look at that test, though, what I am uh, looking to remind you of, let's actually, um, I'm going to do one little thing here, 
and make that just a little bit bigger here on the screen so it fits nicer. Okay, so here are your red blood cells. That's where this story starts. And your hemoglobin A1C are, is linked to the red blood cells that circulate throughout your, your blood vessels. Uh, those blood vessels have uh, a, a very important stop inside your lungs, inside that alveola of your lungs, where they are um, going to exchange a byproduct of carbon dioxide for oxygen. So the oxygen comes into your alveoli, any other viruses or things that you breathe in at the moment come in there too. And this beautiful little three-layered uh, filter uh, is to exchange the carbon dioxide out of the, the serum or the, the circulating liquid in your blood. And it puts oxygen inside your, um, your blood vessels. Uh, if oxygen were only to just hang out in the spaces between red blood cells, the oxygen would go into the closest cell possible and you would never have uh, enough uh, to get to your toes or your brain or other areas that your blood delivers that for you. So in the setting of a very well scripted, uh, uh, could I say, um, uh, roller coaster ride, uh, your hemoglobin A1C or your hemoglobin is what straps the oxygen to de deliver them to different parts of your body. And the place it straps it is a protein called hemoglobin A. It is on the, um, the, the first uh, A, the alpha one protein. And those oxygen are filled with, um, you've got every place with that little heme or the yellow cup and the iron, that trifecta of the hemoglobin, uh, the, the, the globin, which is the name of the protein, the heme, which is the yellow, and that little ball, which is iron. Those three form a place where it really sucks into uh, the oxygen molecule and delivers it to your tissues. That works out really well until this little critter comes along. And he is glucose. Uh, as glucose um, uh, comes into the scene, this, uh, this globin uh, gets, um, gets glycated, which is the word we use when sugar sticks to things that it's not supposed to stick to. So in this example here, one of the four of those seats has been glycated with excess glucose. So the question of tonight is how glycated is your hemoglobin and what does that mean? So uh, although I've got, done about three or four um, quick videos and in my live videos, um, I'm trying to take this to a, just a deeper level, you'll see that that circulation of hemoglobin, uh, circulation of glucose, excuse me, goes in and out of the blood cell. What I'm trying to show you there by increasing the transparency of that red blood cell is that the glucose is uh, permeable to that, that uh, in, in and out of that red blood cell. Um, that isn't um, that, that that is what makes it such a dangerous uh, part of this equation that your red blood cells don't have a mitochondria, they do not have a nucleus, and they are permeable to glucose. Um, um, the the improvement of your hemoglobin A1C starts by improving your average blood sugar because the blood sugar in your serum is also the same concentration of the blood sugar inside your red blood cells. So that's what that image there is for saying, how well does your, um, how well do the red blood cells, uh, how often do they touch one of those hemoglobins? And the answer is, depends on how high your average blood sugar is. So I've had a lot of folks come in saying, Dr. Bosworth, would you recommend this supplement? Would you recommend that I go soak in turmeric um, and, and several other things to say, I want, I want longevity. I, I want to improve my, uh, my health. And as I look up uh, the impact of what those uh, supplements do or what those minor changes in their body do, it is like one one thousandth of the impact that improving your hemoglobin A1C does. Your average blood sugar, which is glycating those hemoglobins as we speak, um, uh, the, the life of that red blood cell lasts about three months. And it, as it uh, deals with the different fluctuations of a higher and lower average blood sugar, uh, that will determine how often those hemoglobin run into glucose. And so if this is a, a, a bed of 100 parking spots for oxygen, uh, uh, in, in reality, a red blood cell has millions of, of, of parking spots for oxygen. But for the math purposes here, we're going to show you 100 parking spots. And if we put all the oxygen in, in the places it belongs for 
um, for what happens in a uh, inside your lungs. Uh, we are now going to uh, show you what happens if 4% of those seats have been glycated. So as our little glucoses run into um, the the um, those parking spots, 4% or 4 seats have been glycated or splatted with sugar. And that would be, f that percentage of 4% um, does, oops, here you go, does equate to a hemoglobin A1C of 4%, which is an average blood sugar of, drum roll, uh, I think it's, yeah, I was gonna say just under 70. So 68, so that, that's really low. I saw somebody put in the comments over there that the lowest one I've seen is 4.4 if uh, for the text to, uh, coming in tonight of who's, you know, what is your hemoglobin A1C. That would be an average blood sugar if your hemoglobin A1C was four, that your average blood sugars would be plus or minus uh, in that 50 to 80 range. And so although that's humanly possible, that is a really low blood sugar. Uh, again, what this doesn't show us is how much insulin it takes to control that, but I would contend that if you have a hemoglobin A1C of four or anywhere in the fours, um, you're you're really um, um, you're really controlling your blood sugar very very nicely. So as I look at um, a couple of things I like to show, average blood sugar here of 70 uh, shows the glucose is along the side, and as those blood sugars um, uh, rise right after someone eats. In this patient, it went up to about 90, and then within a couple of hours was back down to normal. And I'll show you that as an internal medicine physician, uh, what, looking at a lot of these continuous glucose monitors, that is not how quickly our blood sugars go back to normal. Most of us have been around the sun too many times, eating too many years of processed food, and really having um, hours and hours and hours uh, of time spent with that blood sugar higher than 100. And that has then delayed our ability to suppress that number back to our baseline. So it takes longer to return to normal. So as we look at other hemoglobin A1Cs, we're gonna share um, just the, what the teammates are doing here in just a, a minute. But a hemoglobin A1C of five, so that would be five of those parking spots were glycated or splat with sugar, kind of gum in the seat of that hemoglobin. 5% uh, of those are done, and that would be an average blood sugar of 97. Uh, if we go up to uh, the what, what those average sugars look like, they hang out between 80 and 20, or 80 and 120. And they have a few minutes a month spent at 65 and a few minutes a month spent at... 145. Um, so again, another healthy patient looking at, at what happens to, so it's a little more realistic for many of, this would be a healthy patient that comes into my internal medicine clinic, but notice that their blood sugars start out in the 80 range, it shoots up to 140 after a meal, and then it's really getting back down to that baseline about by about three and a half hours. Um, and if you look at a 24-hour span of eating, this will be three different meals I'm gonna show you here, just showing how high the blood sugars do get after you eat. You'll notice the morning uh, uh, rise of uh, cortisol, that's that dawn effect where glucoses go up before they even wake up. In fact, they wake up because the glucose was risen. And then those three times where they ate food gave you an average blood sugar of 100. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not terrible, um, but here is where more patients get to, and that is their blood sugars do not get back to baseline before they eat their next meal. Uh, so their blood sugars throughout the day continually rise. Uh, they do increase that blood sugar to 110. That's pretty significant. Uh, we can find lots of disease pathology that is associated with those higher blood sugars. And as the eating window in this patient is about 10 hours uh, it's quite a lot of time spent with that blood sugar high. So their average blood sugar, which is what's where is very predictive of how many things in their health have been glycated. Uh, so let's just buzz through uh, a few other numbers for hemoglobin A1C. If six of your of the a uh, hundred seats are glycated, that's an average blood sugar of 126. Um, that is getting close to diabetes. If you have seven, we officially say diabetes, and your average blood sugar is 154. At this point, we know that you've already erased some functional years uh, for your for brain function. Uh, rest assured, we can help you reverse that, but you have got to lower the average blood sugar in order for that to happen. Happen. We've got to unstick 
the gum that's in those hemoglobins. And the only way that happens is when we recycle these blood cells through your spleen at the end of their life cycle, at the end of the 120 days, that the, the next crop of red blood cells coming out of your bone marrow does not get exposed to sugar as quickly. Uh, so if we go up to eight uh, seats that are splat, we have a, a blood sugar of 183. And then nine gets you up to 211. Uh, I don't think I went any higher today. Um, I've gone higher in some of the other slide decks. All right, so let's take a closer look at um, where average blood sugars um, rise from. So starting here at 3.9, uh, your average blood sugar would be 65. Uh, that is a very low blood sugar. Um, I mean, it's an average. You can have a blood sugar like that when you fast, but I'm talking average. <laughs> Uh, so as you watch the scale up, we're gonna we're gonna uh, pause right there at the higher 4.5 to fives, and then we're gonna take a closer look at 5.1, uh, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, uh, and then 5.6. So just being careful to be mindful of what the average blood sugar is for uh, these um, these units of uh, of glycosylated hemoglobin A1C, I just think it gives you insight that um, when people have that average increase, um, it, it doesn't take long for us to get to the bottom of a very, what I would call dangerous uh, uh, slide deck or dangerous list of diseases. Uh, we'll just pause and let you see. So here, here's the big, big punchline is that disease severity is a linear correlation let me say that again, a linear correlation to increasing your average blood sugars. As happens in our babies, it happens in teenagers, young adults, and in our mild middle to older adults. I'm in that last group. Uh, and as you watch the ages of patient, uh, uh, it, it doesn't have to wait till you're 40 to make an impact. When we look at average blood sugars, uh, you'll see the ones that are written above those babies and children include that irritability, mood, string, mood swings, childhood obesity, excessive daytime sleepiness, compromised learning, fatigue. As you get into teenage years, we get fragmented sleep, anxiety, panic attacks, autism spectrum, ADHD. The higher the disease severity, the higher the average blood sugar. As we reach more towards adult problems of insomnia, chronic inflammation, gut dysfunction, depression, bipolar, mania, lots of mental health issues make this list. The brain is very impacted by the average blood sugar. Uh, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian disease, colitis, obesity, miscarriages, um, seasonal affective disorder, and then hitting into those elder, but also very severe diseases as we move up on this scale, that you have respiratory diseases, pneumonias, increasing immune problems, compromised immunity, autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, dementia, uh, strokes, cancers, Huntington's disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, specifically outlined because they have several uh, lecture or several studies connecting the average blood sugars to them. And then, of course, at the top of the list is Alzheimer's. So again, how what is the what is the point of this chart is that the increase in average blood sugar is linked to all of these disorders, and uh, it is a linear response that the higher uh, the increase in the blood sugar, uh, the more likely it is that you will struggle with these problems. I highlight those ones in blue because they are eight of the top ten killers. Uh, in America, those uh, those blue texts fall into the categories that kill uh, most frequently in America. Uh, so as much as mental health disorders get a very big part of our um, news media, I am I am um, I'm, I'm saddened to say how often it's uh, disrupted in. Um, uh, that, that their healthcare is disrupted by chasing labs, doing things like hemoglobin A1C, but never really taking the time to connect the dots to the patient that what the physician just realized um, is that um, we now know what your life expectancy is when that A1C has gone up by so much. When we see the average blood sugars go up, we can predict things like how well your brain's gonna be working over the course of the next um, several um, uh, several years and lowering it is a huge part of not only what I want for me but also what I want for my staff. So we are about to 
pray to God that the Zoom uh, audio is working. Uh, I'm going to introduce two of the folks on my team. Uh, and you guys are on air now. Hopefully that went away. Oh, hold on. Okay. Uh, I just turned off the sound in Zoom. Uh, okay, let's try. Let's try. Let's try. Uh, okay, so somebody's headphones is doing that. So let's keep Jillian. Let's keep yours off. Yeah, let's turn your sound off. Uh, and let's see if we can do uh, Madison. Can you try giving us a, a shout out? Hi. Yay. Okay. So <laughs> please, everybody, let me know that you can hear Madison. And uh, it's about a two minute delay. So Madison, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell maybe how long you've been on the team. And um, you were with us in Austin checking all these uh, folks' hemoglobin A1Cs with us. So why don't you give a uh, just a, an introduction to how much you liked learning that. <laughs> and then we'll talk about um, uh, your numbers here in a minute. Okay, so I am Madison. I've been on the team for just over a year. I'm actually a graphic designer, but I kind of do whatever is needed. At a girl. I've done, <laughs> yeah, learned video editing to help out. Um, but Dr. Boz convinced me to do keto. I met her through working for her. <laughs> so I've been doing keto for 10 months. And what, what pushed you into doing keto? You. <laughs> <laughs> what was your symptom? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh yeah, I have Hashimoto, so I have a low thyroid. It's managed with medication, but I didn't feel good at all. And I was worried that I was starting to get arthritis and I'm young um, and I was really struggling with fatigue. Right. And I can't remember, was it, uh, it was fish that you didn't like to eat. It wasn't meat. It was just fish wasn't your favorite thing, right? Oh yeah. Having, yeah, not fish, okay. <laughs> but I, you convinced me early on that I should do keto, but I, um, I pushed it off for a while. Okay, so I had a vacation coming up. I had this coming up. I wanted to have my birthday first, but I finally <laughs> jumped in and did it. And so, since you've been keto, what uh, what's happened to uh, your what's happened to your health? I feel really good. Um, mm -hmm. I had I had to use a special mouse for tendinitis, and my hand doesn't hurt anymore. That's why I was thinking I was getting arthritis. My Physiotherapist said I might be. So if I cheat, it starts to hurt again. So ah, I'm definitely <laughs> compliance. <really healthy>. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. So and I, I just feel better in general. I um, I was not overweight, but I was almost overweight, and so I I reached my. I think I'm a very healthy weight now. Right. So but, if <laughs> if you look at that edge, I think I look back in my uh, in my career and I can remember the time where I'm like, I don't have to worry about my weight. I don't have to worry about my weight. And I'm like, dang, I have to worry about my weight now. Uh, so yeah. I, I would think all of us on the team would agree there was nothing uh, wrong with your weight, but we've all seen that edge as women, as women are on our team. We, we are, we hire plenty of men, but uh, this, the women are in the core team for this season of the Dr. Boz channel. And as, as some of your, uh, your other colleagues who've been around the sun a few more times, we've all been to that chapter. We're like, no problem, no problem, no problem, suddenly a problem. Uh, so before we reveal your numbers for your A1C, um, let's see if Jillian's sound works again. Why don't you try it again, Jillian? Oh, perfect. Better? Yay, much better. Okay, so why don't you introduce yourself uh, and um, especially in the settings of you in your household care a lot about hemoglobin A1C and maybe you can tell us why. Um, hi, everybody. I just wanted you to notice our swag. Yay. <laughs> Good, well played, girls. <laughs> uh, and Madison and I sat side by side for three 10 hour days, poking people's fingers and squeezing blood onto the paper to send into. <laughs> so we, re we really bonded. <laughs> You got blood together. You you poked yeah, blood right. together. Um, my husband, uh, I I have you've had me on before, and I for for the re reason why I care so much about A1C is my husband is a type one diabetic, and uh, he finally followed my lead of eating what I cooked, 
and um, every good man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and has really used way less insulin. He's on two different insulins. One's a long acting, and the other one is short acting, and he's using way less of both and he's doing fantastic. His A1C for a type one diabetic is down to, I think, 6.5, which wow. he's never, ever seen before. He's usually eight mm. or if he's not being well, he's 10. So, mm. but since we've been, t we've married f five years just recently and uh, he got his results back. And so we were really very, very pleased with that. Awesome. My turn on the other hand is another story. Well, let's move into that because this is the point of bringing you gals on is we all three got our results back today. In fact, after our team meeting this morning, uh, you guys had had yours and bravely said, well, I'd be willing to go on and talk about my A1C. Uh, and I ha didn't have mine back yet and said, well, if I don't have mine back, I'll just use you guys as the example. But mine has come back too. But let's, let's focus on you first. So, uh, all right, Madison, what's your hemoglobin A1C? It was 5.5. 5. What were you thinking it would be? I thought it would be 5. Yeah? I, I thought that I'm young and I might not be doing perfect, but I'm a healthy weight and I'm doing keto. I was really surprised. Right? It's so, it's so evil when blood tests come back and you're like, but I'm good. <laughs> I've been doing so good and you've lost weight and you are, your energy is up and, you know, your, your um, joint pain is down. You've got lots of body symptoms that really do tell you you are healthier than you were before. And that stinking A1C came back at 5.5. Five. Oh. All right. All right, Jillian, uh, do your big reveal. What, what's your number come back at? Mine was 5.7. R, so R, R. Really not happy with that. Mm-hmm. But I know I now that I've I've had the number in my head for the last twenty four hours or so, I've been ruminating about my behavior. <laughs> oh damn! I, you know, and I know exactly what I'm doing wrong. So that's, yeah, watching you. Mm. Well, I think that's the huge part of this because, you know, blood tests aren't meant to be this shameful place where we say, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. It's meant to give us a warning that this is fixable and that we can make a difference with if it's if we have to use medications. But wow, those numbers, neither of those I would use medications in. I would say, let's see where you're at. So I think that's the bigger part of this conversation tonight it isn't just what is your number, but what will you do next? What's the like one thing that you will do to say, here's where I've been, here's where I've been living, and here's what I'm going to do to step it up to the next level. Jillian, let's have you go first. Okay. I'm actually going to give you two. Okay. And the first one is I, I say to everybody when they ask where I live in the keto continuum in the baseline, and I always say six. But okay. the truth is, it's five. <laughs> I'm still putting cream in that coffee, mm, you know, and, so I, and I really think that won't affect me. <laughs> that won't affect me at all. And the second one is uh, doing a weekly 36-hour fast with really no calories and no gum, no mints, no calories, no cream, no nothing but salt and water. That's what I did. And I did it yesterday for the first time. So it ended this morning. And my numbers this morning were really good. So when I don't cheat myself. That, right, right. We can tell everybody else what we're doing. I mean, I think that's really a, a powerful point too, because when I look at, uh, you know, advising people, it, it again is a great place to see that they have come along. And I, you know, I watch the folks that are here in my support group here in Tampa and, you know, the seasons of life happen, they disappear for a while and they come back and they're a little heavier. And then a few weeks into listening to everybody and they're down, they're back on doing some of those right things. And I, I don't, I don't doubt that they are are uh, very connected uh, to what is the right thing to do. What is often a little unsettling is how we all can slip back into saying, oh, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. So it, taking that cream out of the coffee, I can remember that stepping stone for me because I just, I was doing a really, I know, right? It tastes so good. It tastes so good. 
<laughs> um, that the the improvement in um, my numbers was shocking. But I also think the better the best benefit you have, Jillian, is that you've been doing a lot of things right and taking your numbers from a 5.7 to closer to a five. We'd love to get them in the fours. Um, it's not going to hurt anything like it was when you first went keto. And when you when you take a body that doesn't know how to keep, use a ketone and a life where carbs aren't counted and they aren't really something you're super mindful of. Uh, boy, it's a, it's a bloody nose for about a month. Just learning the mistakes, feeling the sink of energy as your body gets used to it. But look at that one 36 hour fast and the numbers are up and you feel good. Uh, it is about staying the course, that steady, uh, the tortoise wins this race gals, changing behavior one tiny little step at a time is the right thing to do. Um, Let's have you push mute on your speakers and let um, and let uh, Madison answer her question. So, Madison, uh, what's one thing that you're looking at doing to say, how can I improve what I'm up to? Okay, so I'm doing 16-8 and eating two meals a day. I think what would help me the most would be to go back to tracking everything in chronometer because I think the thing I'm doing wrong is letting the carbs slip up and up and up and not really realizing. So I think the the easiest thing, if you're talking about turtle winning a race, would be just making sure I'm I'm 20 carbs or less. Yeah, tracking I absolutely. Do, I could say fasting and stuff, but I, I think that would be the. Yeah, I mean, if there's a fast that happens, especially you are younger than than we old women. <laughs> We we have, uh, you have the, I know, right? Just like get that hairy eyebrow out and stare at her and tell her what to do. Uh, <laughs> we have the disadvantage of not having as the youth that you have to flex. And I'm saying that because for heaven's sakes, do it. Um, as you look at your metabolism, it really is able to live at two nice meals per day, which shouldn't feel restrictive, especially if you're keeping those total carbs per day down. And, and I would really encourage you to say, just, do it for the better part of, um, I, I would actually encourage you, both of you, and of course, being part of my team allows me to send you the tests to check your A1C in, in four weeks. Uh, just watch what happens when you drop uh, or change a behavior and then check that number again. And what, what I've learned with hemoglobin A1Cs watching them in my clinic is that when I check them every three months, they forget. They just kind of lose focus of what they were doing. There's no really a accountability to say, did I make a difference? And if the numbers didn't change much, uh, I do. I think, you know, you are changing out a third of the crop by the time that one month is up. So by lowering the blood sugars uh, enough to change that number, it is a true tra trajectory that says whatever change you made was enough to move the needle and just stay there and watch what happens when the average catches up at the three-month mark. So um, you know, other, other um, you know, major headlines that you just hit on was tracking is, uh, is accountability. And even though an A1C in and of itself is less than, less than fun when it comes back at the numbers that we've got, um, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it's in the same camp as checking your chronometer app for saying, well, how many carbs really did I have? And that personal accountability, even though it's you looking in the mirror, <laughs> is a big deal. It's a really big deal. So uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for both of you coming on and tolerating my audiovisual uh, mishaps that happen routinely on this show. <laughs> but I, I think this requires that we're going to have to have you back to see how you're doing in a month. What do you think? All right. Okay. All right. So if you guys stay tuned, you'll see what my number is here in just a second. Uh, I, I will warn everybody that I had um, the uh, I had the slide deck prepared that if I didn't, I wasn't able to get um, uh, the gals to come on, I was going to show their results this way. Uh, or if something went wrong with audio, I was going to do it this way. So here's just the rest of that slide deck because I think it's going to give us a little bit of a hint of um, this was uh, Madison's results from her um, her pricked finger. And again, when we were prepping for KetoCon and learning how to do this, we tested one another's hemoglobin A1Cs. And so this was hers, 5.5. Uh, and then this was Jillian's, 5.7. So again, if you kind of look back at that average, a average blood sugars, uh, that's uh, getting uh, nowhere. It's not diabetes, but boy, it's on the edge of that green. And here's a big drum roll. My hemoglobin A1C yeah, 5.6, right in the middle. So uh, both uh, uh, those uh, 
those um, attempts at, um, oopsie, I didn't mean to change the slides. That's not supposed to change automatically. <laughs> what I was about to say, though, is that what I look to do to improve my numbers is I used to be really great on Instagram of showing you my numbers on a regular basis. Get up in the morning, check my numbers, send that into, you know, put that, post that on a social media. Um, but somewhere in moving across the country with teenagers, the business uh, businesses, um, and <clears throat> resettling, I got out of the habit that I'm really only checking my numbers of uh, the Dr. Boz ratio on the show or a few spotty times during the week. And in fairness, it's been good. It's it's not a bad number. But I know that if I would check the, the mornings after I have uh, a little you know, I'm going to have a glass of wine with my sister tonight. Tomorrow's morning numbers or something I should I should be accountable for. I should share. And not because I need to like air dirty laundry, but just to say this is how I change my behavior. I'm going to do a quick little lesson uh, on why Dr. Bob's ratio matters so much and how I think that if I begin posting that again inside my Instagram feeds, even though it's boring and it's not nearly as sexy as some of the reels that are out there, I think that stability of showing what are my morning numbers, what are my morning numbers will help me clean up uh, some of the habits that happen. Um, I now commute an hour to work in an hour home. And many times if my son doesn't get done with his practice until late at night, I'm eating much later than I would have in a in my previous chapter I would have had sardines at three o'clock and not eaten afterwards but now I'm you know eating with him or finding a way to get to supper with my husband and it doesn't always work out well for my numbers but then again I'm not looking so the first step I would do is um, be checking my Dr. Bob's ratio so as I look at just reminding you why this matters and you know I really got to refresh my mind and reteach this today when I was on the podcast with Dr. Mindy uh, and said you know there are a few times in medicine that measuring the exact uh, molecule is not as good as measuring what that hormone uh, controls and this is true in the case of insulin Insulin is very volatile, it goes up and down, emotions, stress, uh, and even just checking it five times in 15 minutes, you're going to see it move quite a bit. Uh, I, I used to check fasting insulins in folks, and I've really just pulled away from that because it's the volatility of it is not as educational for the patient as their average blood sugars, as looking at their Dr. Boz ratio, because the two things insulin controls uh, is what your blood sugar is and then what your ketones are. So if you have a blood sugar of 100 uh, and you have a ketone, uh, if you have a blood sugar of 100, it doesn't tell me where your insulin is. But if I look at a blood sugar of 100 and a ketone of 1.5, it tells me that your insulin is very low. Uh, but if I look at a blood sugar of 100 and your ketones are 0 0.5 or almost unmeasurable, it tells me that the insulin is quite high. And so it is the combination of glucose and the ketones that show me how much insulin, especially the function of ins insulin is actually more important to me than the, um, the actual number. Like insulin resistance says, yeah, it takes three cups of insulin. I mean, using that metric in general, three cups of insulin to keep this person's glucose uh, uh, controlled at a level where their A1C was 6.2. Uh, but it's that excessive amount of insulin that's really causing several of those problems, and it will sh it will it will push the, that hemoglobin A1C up, that average blood sugar up over time because of how insulin fails. When we look at both glucose and ketones together, uh, that is really what. A, a glucose ketone index, or if you don't like uh, converting the the labels, we use the Dr. Boz ratio, which is just dirty math. It means uh, that you take the glucose, the big number, and you divide by the little number. But as you watch people improve their metrics and do the things that both Jillian and Madison uh, have committed to doing, which is one's going to track and the other one's going to step up on that level of uh, the keto continuum by saying, I'm really going to work on that dang morning coffee and removing the fat from the coffee. Uh, as much as we all like it, uh, she's going to step up to the next layer and really tighten that in and, and then add a stress to her system, which will be a weekly fast. 
Um, so as the glucose is improved with ketogenic uh, keto continuum, that <laughs> ketones also improve with the, with uh, their their progression along the continuum. Uh, and when we look at what really we're measuring with the Dr. Boz ratio, we do see those glucose decrease. We see those ketones rise. And over time, when um, as they get healthier, it's not that insulin gets to zero. It just leaves that inflammatory phase and really is back to a functional hormone for our bodies. And we can track that. We can track that by looking at a Dr. Boz ratio. Uh, so I'm definitely uh, in the camp that I like my Dr. Boz ratios at 50 or less. I know that my brain feels the best when I do that. Um, when I'm helping people lose weight, I push that their Dr. Boz ratio is uh, always less than 100. Um, and that's been proven again and again for, through our clinic that if they can keep that Dr. Boz ratio less than 100, they are not going to stall out on their weight loss. Um, but you're going to have to find yourself on that continuum and continue to push uh, to, to stress your metabolism. When I'm working with an autoimmune problem, I like that Dr. Boz ratio to be less than 40. And when I'm working with some of my most advanced um, patients of uh, a seizure disorder or cancer protocol, I like that Dr. Boz ratio to be less than 20. Um, so I'm going to do one more, a few more slides, and I, I'm going to have to say that I probably won't get to the questions tonight just looking at the time, um, but I will save them for next week. Um, I have a couple other guests that I was thinking to have on if I got this sound thing to work. Um, and indeed, um, the questions I'm seeing that are over on that other page look really interesting to answer. But let's get uh, through a few things that I think will help close the loop on teaching about why I'm going to track my Dr. Boz ratio. Uh, so looking at overall insight insulin is what I am trying to improve. That my average blood sugar, my goal is to have it at 4.5. Um, I know that I can do that if I would just be a lot, <laughs> not do some of the things that I've been doing, which is eating later at night, um, treating myself uh, more often than I should uh, with uh, that sweet flavor or, uh, or a glass of wine. And um, I'm going to start right after my sister leaves town. <laughs> Uh, this is just a, an example of uh, two days or looking into that first and second day of someone eating a very healthy diet. Um, this would also be somebody who is not metabolically sick. They would not be like me. I've had um, insulin resistance. I've had a, a weight problem um, that's been reversed a few years ago and been really easy to maintain on a ketogenic diet. Um, but in most healthy people, they burn those glucose uh, numbers during the day. And even if their glucose isn't as high as 110 like this chart so shows, the glucose does go down during the night, um, especially if they get that final meal in during daylight hours. As we watch what ketones are doing during the day, a very strong metabolic health. Um, I like to contend that this example would be I just did a mission trip in Honduras. So this would be the metabolic health of one of those kids in Honduras that get three little meals per day. They do not get snacks at night. They practically live off rice, beans, and a little meat. Um, and I did encourage them to eat sardines there. <laughs> but they don't have, many didn't have access to refrigeration, let alone uh, the processed foods in the evening. So um, watching to see what that chart really teaches us is to show you that glucose and ketones do flip. If you were looking inside every cell, uh, they get a choice of using glucose or ketones, one or the other. And as the ketones rise, um, when the glucose fuel runs out, that is what we call metabolically flexible. I hear athletes talk about this all the time, and this is what my brain does, saying, well, they, they should be able to flip between ketones and, and glucose at a, at a, a moment's notice. Um, uh, when I see really ripped athletes say, I'm not keto, and I'm like, well, I think you are. I think every time you stop eating long enough to lean up that that tight, that um, you know, removal of inflammation, that they are flipping their fuel from ketones to glucose rather robustly, uh, and they do reap the benefits of that mentally, physically. And um, what I like to point out is to, to just watch what that Dr. Boz ratio does when we're learning about this. So Dr. Boz ratio in that first section, like during that 6 a.m. to noon, where the blood sugars are averaging at about 110, and, and the ketones are at 0 0.5, that would be a Dr. Boz ratio of 191. Now, again, as I'm trying to reverse my health, I want mine to stay in a zone that is um, 
in that between 40 and 60 range. Uh, I want to wake up in the morning with a number that's somewhere between 40 and 80 and then push it into that 40 to 60 range. Um, and when I fast each week, I really do want a Dr. Boz ratio that's better than that. When we sleep at night is when we should be stressing out some of our metabolism. And again, this doesn't always happen to the folks that have been traveling around that sun a few times. I'm 50 years old this year and I know that my metabolism does not switch this quickly, but it once did. And Madison can really reap the benefits that her youth will flip her metabolism rather quickly, especially because she addressed this so young in her life, um, thanks to being on the in the vortex of influence by Dr. Boz. Um, honestly, she really had a minor problem, and she made a few tiny changes in her health, and she reaped the benefits. So it's what I would want for anybody. But what I like to point out is that 100 flip point, that we know that you are tapping into fat storages at that 100 point. And those kids in Honduras, this is again what this graph is built on, is uh, they are storing fat during the day. They will overeat for the amount of glucose their body can burn. Uh, but it's that stored fat that will end up as a resource. They will empty as much fat as they as they create in the hours that they sleep. And that is how they would stay lean. That's how they would not get overweight. Um, and when we watch, notice that I just changed the sugars along the side as I changed that, uh, uh, that um, uh, that slide. And this, um, this uh, uh, average blood sugar of 140 with ketones at 0.5 puts uh, the Dr. Boz ratio at 280. But during the nighttime where those ketones still bounce up above 100 and, or above 1.5, that Dr. Boz ratio, um, oh, actually I had the ketones bounce down to um, 82. So if, if the glucose was 80 while they were sleeping, while the ketones were 1.0, which is not unreasonable that's not that that's not sex that sexy of a metabolism um, it, it does change that the dr. Boz ratio during the day though is now 1400 because they have almost zero ketones during their awake hours uh, their evening uh, ketones uh, while they're sleeping are down to 77 and notice that they really don't start to lose weight until a later part of that curve uh, so I, I show this slide not so that you can become an expert at the Dr. Boz ratio, but to show you that my hemoglobin A1C of 5.6, I want it to be better than that. I want it to have a, uh, a an improved metabolism that is reflective, reflect, reflective of uh, blood sugars that are closer to um, closer to the um, average in the 80 to 85 range, and. And I, I know when I put out goals that people think that I must be there instantly. And I'm just as human as you. I have bad habits too. But that's what this is about. It's about a place where you can come, you can learn about the science. And just because I know the right thing to do doesn't mean I'm going to do the right thing. But I'm going to keep keep hanging out and showing you what I am doing. Checking my numbers a little more routinely on uh, Instagram is uh, one of my steps that I'm gonna try to do. You're welcome to join me and use hashtag Dr. Boz ratio. So again, my ketones went up to 1.3 during that and my um, my gl glucose stayed about the same, 92 to 91. So if somebody wants to run the numbers for me on what that Dr. Boz ratio is, uh, I do want you to look carefully at um, how well a hemoglobin A1C is doing in your world. You do not need permission. Um, to uh, to check your hemoglobin A1C. I'll have uh, one of my teammates put the link for uh, the uh, hemoglobin A1C test in the in the chat. And actually, I can do it too. Um, to make sure that if you've got um, access to um, for, to spend the forty dollars on a test, you can watch your hemoglobin A1C and and really take notice of how many, uh, how high is your blood sugar on average, what that does for your own um, um, health predictions. And if you're watching this on replay and haven't seen our latest videos on hemoglobin A1C, I will click that at the end screen. So go ahead and give that a click. Uh, until then, we will see you next week. And to all of those folks out there having uh, a time with their sisters, I will join you uh, and celebrate just that relationship. So we will see you next week, everybody. We are the Dr. Boz Show, reversing medical problems with healthy keto living. See you next week.